You will hear a telephone conversation between a language student and an advisor. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Homestay Language Learning, Lisa McDowell here. How can I help you? Hello, my name's Dan. Hello, Dan. And I'm going to be living with a family in Edinburgh for three months, so I'd like some advice on what to bring with me. I'm flying in via Singapore on the 15th. Right. Well, perhaps most important of all are your documents. Vaccination certificate, sponsor's letter, and the certifying letter from us for immigration. Yes, I've got all those in order, I think. What I'm really wondering about are money and clothes and things for my room. Personal effects, in other words. OK. Let's start with cash. You'll already have money in your bank account here, of course, but make sure when you get here you have some cash on you. Pounds, that is, not euros or dollars. How much do you suggest? I'd say 50 as an absolute minimum. OK. Now, the next thing is which clothes to bring. What do you think? Well, as I'm sure you know, it can get pretty cold here, so you will need some warm clothing. There are shops near here that sell winter clothes quite cheaply, so you really don't need to bring much. Do make sure, though, that you have at least one thick sweater and a jacket with you when you arrive here. The temperature is likely to be a lot lower than in Singapore. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. Now. Something else I'm not sure about is whether to bring my computer. It's a laptop, so it won't take up much room. Two problems. Firstly, it might not be compatible with the electricity supply in this country. And secondly, there's a risk of it getting broken in transit. Someone travelling here had hers smashed only last month. But surely I can carry it as hand luggage. Usually, yes, but because of all the tight security right now, you may have to check it in. So my advice is to leave yours at home. OK, I think I will. Is there anything else you'd advise against bringing? Well, you won't need household or cooking things. They'll all be provided. And importing food, of course, isn't allowed by customs, though I imagine you already knew that. Well, yes. But there are one or two things I'd suggest you find room for in your suitcase. Yes? Perhaps a few of your favourite cassettes or compact discs. Of course, you might be able to find them in the shops here, but then again, you might not. That's a good idea. Anything else? Yes. Some photographs of people and places that are special to you could be nice. They can really make your room feel like home. <laughs> it's just a thought. Hmm. I'll see if I've got a few good ones. <laughs> Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Just a few points about packing. Make sure all your cases are clearly labelled, in English, with your host family's name and address, just in case they go missing on the way. It has been known to happen. What name do I write, by the way? It's Wark. Lewis and Amy Wark. 
So that's W-A-L-K? <laughs> it's actually W-A-R-K. But we'll be posting full details to you later this week. Right, fine. And I'd better put some essentials in my hand luggage. Enough for a night or two in case, as you say, anything happens to my main cases. <laughs> yes. I'd recommend a change of T-shirt and socks and so on, plus any medication you may need, and a toothbrush, of course. And my tights. <laughs> Your tights? Yes, for the flight. Wearing them helps prevent deep vein thrombosis when you're <sighs> flying long distances, not getting any exercise. Oh, yes, I've heard about that. Now, talking about exercise, there's one last thing. When you've packed your baggage, check you can carry it, all of it, at least 500 metres without any help. You may have to do that. OK. Well, thanks for all your help. You've cleared up a lot of points. Oh, you're welcome. Have a safe journey, and we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about a printing process. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. As I've made clear in earlier lectures, many different solutions have been proposed to the basic technological problem of getting meaningful marks onto paper. In other words, several different forms of printing have developed over the years, many of which are still in use today for different purposes. This week, I'd like to discuss the rotogravure process. This is one of the most widely used printing processes, and after describing how the process works, I'll be describing some of its industrial uses and the advantages and disadvantages of this form of printing. As the name implies, rotogravure is a form of printing in which large cylindrical pieces of metal rotate, while the paper to be printed passes between them. The paper is held in place against the printing surface by the impression roller. The weight of this roller is one of the factors that affect how much ink is actually transferred to the paper. Remember that this roller does not directly transfer ink onto the paper. The side in contact with the impression roller remains blank, and it's the other side of the paper which is actually the printed side. The impression roller presses the paper against the ink-bearing roller generally known as the gravure cylinder. This roller is etched or engraved using either a laser or a diamond-tipped etching machine. This creates a large number of tiny holes in the surface of the roller which hold the ink. The depth and size of these holes determines how much ink is picked up from the ink fountain, which the whole printing assembly rests in. How much ink is picked up in turn determines the density of the image produced. As it rotates, the lower roller picks up more ink on its surface than is required, and this needs to be removed before contact with the paper. A flat edge, called the doctor blade, scrapes against the surface and removes all ink which is not in one of the holes on the surface of the lower roller. This should lead to a clean image. 
Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now that we understand a little of the mechanics of rotogravure printing, I'd like to look at it in the wider context of the printing industry and discuss the main uses. One of the main advantages of the rotogravure process is that the amount of ink which can be transferred to the paper is high compared to other printing methods. This means that a broad density range can be produced. In other words, with rotogravure, it's possible to produce many different light and dark shades, making it particularly suitable for reproducing photographs and fine art. For shorter print runs, some other processes may give a finer image, but rotogravure is ideal for jobs that involve printing, for example, a million magazines. One common place where you'll see printed matter that has been produced by rotogravure is in the advertising material that is often inserted into Sunday newspapers. Of course, it's not just paper that can be printed by rotogravure. It's a very flexible process, since the rollers used can be made to any size required. Whether it's consumer packaging or large rolls of floor covering that need to be printed, rotogravure is a relatively cheap, quick method that is used in a variety of industries. This isn't to say that rotogravure is without its disadvantages. Probably the main drawback is the fact that, with large areas of colour, the dots are visible, even without using any kind of magnifying aid. Now, does anyone have any questions about the rotogravure process? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a discussion between two students and their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. OK, guys. First off, well done. That was a very good presentation yesterday. Now I'm just going to ask you questions about it before I give you my feedback. Is that OK? Sure. Of course. Right. Well, in that case, tell me, Niall, why did you choose to talk about Rafael Nadal? To tell you the truth, I didn't. I think I... Better let Sheena handle this one. Sheena? Yes, it was my decision to pick Nadal. Now, that might be a strange choice for a presentation entitled Someone Who Inspired Me to Study Psychology, but... Yes, but I was going to say, it does seem rather an odd choice. Was it simply down to the fact that he's a sporting hero of yours and so a role model? You talk about him a lot, Sheena, so this much is clear. It's true, Nadal is someone I look up to, but my reasons for choosing him were totally professional. You see, I doubt, perhaps in the history of tennis, that there was ever a better match player than him, and that got me thinking, what is the secret to his success? 
How does he control his nerves so splendidly? The more we started to look into his background, the more I realised Sheena was right. Nadal was a perfect candidate for this study. He is, on so many levels, a very well-balanced character, and it was fascinating to gain an insight into the mind of this great champion over the last few weeks. I'll admit that I was at first somewhat unsure about whether or not I should back Sheena on this one, but it didn't take long for our research to put us at ease. So, while most of the students were researching Freud and other visionaries in the field of psychology and psychoanalysis, you were looking into a present-day sports star. Does that not strike you as a little odd? Of course, we knew it was a risk. After all, there was a danger that no one, least of all you, would take us seriously. When we stood up on stage and started our presentation. That said, I think it is in the spirit of psychology to be inquisitive and adventurous, and not just stick to the conventional. Otherwise, how would the field have come so far as it has done already? Well, I must say your risk certainly paid off. Yours was, without a shadow of a doubt, the most interesting and original presentation I saw. And judging by the reactions of the other students, I would have to say that everyone else was equally impressed. Thank you. I'm so glad you think so. Yes, but notwithstanding your excellent presentation content, we must remember that the marks for this project are awarded based on a number of criteria, and we'll examine those in a few minutes. But first, another question: Where did you find your sources? Well, and I don't quite know how we managed it, but we were able to secure a face-to-face -face interview with Nadal. While he was over here for the Wimbledon Tennis Championship, so we weren't reliant on newspaper articles and interviews or any other forms of secondary sources. We did, however, find the library sports archive an invaluable backup aid to help us fill in the gaps and piece together our interpretation of what makes Nadal such a mentally strong champion. Before you hear the rest of the discussion. You have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Okay. Well, as I said, congratulations again for your excellent work. Now it's time for my feedback. The first area where marks were awarded is in your use of equipment. I felt that had you not been a little too reliant on the overhead projector. And had you, for example, used the interactive whiteboard and audio equipment a little more effectively. You would have received top marks in this section. As things stand, though, your use of equipment was still very satisfactory. It's just a shame, as it was an opportunity missed to score full points. The next area I was asked to assess is content. As you might have guessed, I simply can't fault you on that. Highly original work, so well done. As for your timing. I felt that the two of you were a little too over-rehearsed, so the presentation felt at times a little robotic. That said, again, it was very satisfactory, and you would get full points for effort. Sadly, though, there is such a thing as trying too hard, and that cost you top marks here. I'm afraid. Oh, I see. Right. What was particularly impressive, though, was the thick handout you'd prepared for everyone. I took it home to read through it afterwards, and it was very well written. But not alone that, it also enhanced my experience of the presentation itself on the day, as I was able to refer to the handout for further information on what was being discussed and to answer any questions I had. Very nice. As for your level of interaction. Well, you had so much that you were intent on packing into your twenty-minute time slot that, sadly, you ran out of time at the end, which left no room whatsoever for interaction, and no one had the chance to ask you any questions. 
You've probably guessed, therefore, that you did worse than average in this department, and unfortunately, your score will have to reflect this. Oh my goodness, everything sounded so positive at the start. That is a big disappointment. We work so hard. No, no, don't be so quick to get deflated. Remember, your presentation skills only count for 15% of the project grade. Your score in this assessment, even if it were terrible, would still not be enough to prevent you from getting top marks overall. It's very hard to score well in the presentation assessment anyway, so believe me, you both did reasonably well. Thank you. I wish I felt like that. Yes, your feedback was very constructive. We're just a little disappointed with ourselves. Why? That's the end of section three. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. The word thesaurus comes from Greek and means treasure house. So, to tell us more about Roger's thesaurus is linguist Dr. Cindy Channer. Now then, Cindy, we know Roger classified the English language. Well, the 150th edition has just come out. It sold 32 million copies. Yes, that's right, 32 million. What is it? Roger's Thesaurus. Now, Roger's Thesaurus is a type of dictionary in which words with similar meanings are grouped together. The word Thesaurus comes from Greek and means treasure house. So, to tell us more about Roger's Thesaurus is linguist Dr. Cindy Channer. Now then, Cindy, we know Roger classified the English language but what do we know about the man himself? Well, Mr. Roger, or to give him his full name, Peter Mark Roger, was a very interesting man indeed. He grew up in London, he was French, and he spent his early life in a French community there. He later travelled all the way from London to Edinburgh to study medicine at the university there and graduated when he was 19 years old. And he later went on to become a founder of Manchester Medical School. So his life focused around his career as a doctor? Well, actually, no. Roger had a very wide range of interests indeed. In fact, he was a writer and wrote about many topics such as bees, the kaleidoscope, and even perception and feeling in animals. And he was an inventor too. In fact, in 1814, he invented an early version of the slide rule. The slide rule? Yes, the device that can calculate numbers. Then, ten years later, he developed a prototype for the cine camera, and he also got involved in a range of different projects. For example, he became head of a commission investigating London's water supply, and he developed a method of water filtration through sand. And he was involved in the area of education. He was one of the founders of London University. And do you play chess by any chance, Mark? Yes, I do. Well, Roger invented the travelling chess set. So next time you're playing a game of chess on a train, you have Mr. Roger to thank. So how did he actually find the time to classify the English language? Well, he only turned his full attention to the thesaurus when he retired. And that was when he was in his 70s. 
So, what inspired him to write the thesaurus? Well, Roger believed that he should bring as much happiness and knowledge to the greatest number of people. So, during his career as a doctor, he gave free treatment to patients who couldn't afford to pay. We also know that he set up a clinic to help poor people to recover from operations and serious illnesses. Basically, he wrote the thesaurus to help people learn. He aimed to help those who needed practice in writing. He believed that writing skills would help people become more independent and lead happier lives. How popular is the thesaurus today? Well, it was first published in 1852, and it has never been out of print since. In fact, the book has become more popular with each edition that comes out. The invention of the crossword puzzle in 1913 certainly helped to increase the sales figures, though. I think the main reason why it is so popular is that it's thematic, so you can come across words that you've never even thought of when you began looking for the word in the first place. Thanks, Cindy. Now join us again after this short break when I'll be talking to Derek Spode, chairperson of East Anglian News. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.